Welcome everyone to the webinar tonight with Professor Derek Black. We'll go just a few seconds to allow everybody to get into the webinar and we'll get started. So to everyone who's joined us tonight, you're in for a, a really exciting treat. We have, you know, uh, one of the leading scholars in the nation in terms of education law, constitutional law, civil rights law. And so we are we are so extremely proud to have him here with us tonight. And we hope that you will enjoy it. Before I introduce him, I do want to say a few quick things. We are going to save time at the end for your questions. So, you know, hang tight and, you know, keep, keep them going. If you'd like to uh, put them in, in the chat, you're welcome to do that if it makes you comfortable so you don't forget when you're thinking of a question. And we are gonna do our very best to get to the end, to all of these. If we're unable to do that by any chance, we will we'll bug uh, Derek to answer them later and we'll send them to you in our email. We will be sending a, a link to the recording of this event and um, uh, over the next couple of days so that you can share it, listen again and share it with your friends. It will be on YouTube. So, um, this is also, I hope you agree with me, and I hope that's why you're here, is an extremely important topic right now, looking at public education and the assault on the public school system that's going on in North Carolina. Let me tell you a little bit about Derek. He's a professor of law and the Ernest Hollins Chair in Constitutional Law at the University of South Carolina um, School of Law. I'm also proud to slip in his bio that he actually attended UNC's law school and graduated there and has been involved ever since that time and, and kept a, uh, an interest in the Landro case and lots of things around the work to look for how we educate our disadvantaged children. But let me also mention that he directs the law school's Constitutional Law Center. His areas of expertise I've mentioned, education law, constitutional law, civil rights, the focus of his current scholarship is the intersection of constitutional law and public education, particularly as it pertains to educational quality, equality and fairness for disadvantaged children. His research has been published in the Yale Law Journal, Stanford Law, uh, California Law Review, and many other places. His work has been cited by federal courts and various briefs before the US Supreme Court. So I think that you're going to, in, uh, if you have not had a chance yet to read his book, we are hoping you will do so because you will not be disappointed. Um, he is author of a leading education law book, case book, um, Education Law, Equality, Fairness, and, and Reform, which I'm sure many of you try, um, and folks that might be going into the law or are in the law now might like to get your hands on. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift over. I also want to introduce quickly to you, uh, Dr. Heather Coons. Heather is going to be our moderator tonight. She is the Director of Communication at Public Schools First, and she advocates for all things related to public schools and is quite a expert herself in these, some of these issues. Um, she uh, started her career um, as a high school English teacher. So she has a lot of expertise that um, I, um, I covet, you know, and having that real experience of being a, a teacher. She has her master's degree from Stanford University and her doctorate in educational measurement and evaluation from the UNC um, at Chapel Hill. So we're so happy to have her here tonight moderating, and we're going to go ahead and get started. I must say, though, Dean Boger, welcome. I know that you are happy to be here with your student, uh, Derek. Yeah, this so is quite this is quite a night. Uh, thank you so much for joining, Dean Boger um, and Derek Black. We are thrilled to have you. I flashed your book before. Um, I just want to say that um, I really enjoyed reading your book. Uh, and as I was reading it, I was so struck by these huge gaps in my prior knowledge about the understanding of the United States history and the founding role. The, you know, the, the role that our founding early leaders believe that public education 
plays in the existence of our democracy. So it just was astonishing to me how little I knew. So I was thrilled to have read the book and I hope everyone on this call reads it because you will um, learn a lot. Um, and, but before we get into the specifics uh, and detailed questions, can you please tell us about yourself, a um, little bit about your background and what motivated you to write this book? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks to you and uh, to Yvonne for having me on. And now if I had known that uh, Ian Boger was going to be on here, maybe I would have declined because I won't be able to get away with any falsehoods or ambiguities <clears throat> unless he throw a Socratic method at me in the middle to make sure I've gotten it, gotten it correct. So make sure his mic is turned off uh, and, and muted and, and otherwise we will proceed. But but to your, uh, to your question of, of what uh, motivated me, I mean, ultimately, I started this project as I was watching, you know, some of the largest, well, actually, what were the largest uh, public protests in the history of the United States on state capital grounds. I don't think actually many people clearly articulated as such. I mean, when you look at Raleigh, for instance, 20,000 strong, um, two years in a row, now, I don't know if those were the largest public protests on state grounds in the history of North Carolina, <clears throat> but certainly 15,000 on the steps of the South Carolina Capitol was the largest in the history of that Capitol and 50,000 uh, in Arizona was the largest there. And so I think that that was really inspiring to me. I don't think that things were being said that that uh, that Jack didn't say to me 20 years before. Um, he, he'll probably get more references tonight than he bargained for. But what was different is that you had people outside of law schools and outside of schools of education making these arguments very forcefully and also using a lot of rights rhetoric. You know, I mean, one of the things that really struck me was that teachers uh, were consistently talking about the needs of their students and what the states owed them, not just as a matter of policy, but also as a matter of their state constitutions. And so this was compelling to me. And I began just thinking, well, I'm, I'm going to tell the story of of this movement and i was so so taken by it and um i got an agent at some point and, and he said you know number one you're not a reporter and, and number two you know the new york times and washington post is doing a pretty good job at that so i don't really think that's what you need to add to the story um, if, if you've got something to say it, it's, it's different than that and, and maybe bigger than that and so i began to um to sort of step back and, and look at it in a broader perspective. And actually now that I'm thinking about it again, Jack wrote an article and I was a law student, uh, something around the eye of the storm is he, he phrased it. He was talking about Charlotte, as I recall, and desegregation there. And it struck me, although I wasn't thinking about him at the moment, is that that this particular historical moment, it's very difficult to interpret what is happening when you are standing in the middle of the eye of the storm. I mean, we ultimately had multiple different things happening at the same time. Of course, we had a national uh, recession going on, but we had a war on uh, public school teachers happening. We have had drastic cuts in school funding happening, and we had exponential growth in charters and vouchers occurring. And in the middle of that, that's just a lot to interpret and sort of understand. Of course, it's all database, right? And, you know, is this going to improve or not improve student test scores? And so what I hope to do in this book was to sort of step back and try to put it in a much larger historical perspective. And the more I did that, I think the more I became motivated. Um, the story became came full circle to me really at the end of it. I mean, I'm a product of, of public school through and through and, and have always prized that uh, opportunity that I received. But there was, you know, there was one of my colleagues, actually John Hale, since you guys had John on, you know, John had read the book in an early draft and, and John said, well, Derek, you, you need to talk about yourself. And I said, no, 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 John, you, you don't talk about yourself in these sorts of books. But he said, well, I think there's something important to sort of say there. I, I'm not convinced that, that John was right overall, but um, with some of my sort of professional uh, experiences, I think that's what he wanted me to talk about. But I really began to reflect upon my own childhood and in that introduction, um, I said, and it really wasn't until I wrote the book that I sat down and counted the number of different homes that I lived in over the course of the first seven, eight years of my education. And it was actually, it was, it was kind of uh, a little bit troubling to me. I never sort of thought of myself as experiencing sort of uh, unsteady housing, or I certainly had, you know, sort of unsteady 
family uh, relationships, I suppose. But in any event, um, it really was the public schools. It were the public schools that created this sort of anchor for me. And as I said, there I had public school teachers who wanted more for me than I wanted for myself or more than I can imagine for myself. And so that's my experience right in the, in the 80s, primarily, early 90s. But what I also point out is the reason why those teachers were there was because people who preceded me on this earth by more than a century had decided the state of Tennessee was constitutionally obligated to make sure that every child in the state of Tennessee had access to public education. So it wasn't just the good graces of the teachers of Clinton, Tennessee, but rather the good graces of people that preceded them and understood what public education would mean uh, for the future of that state and of course, North Carolina as well. And what I say towards the end of that introduction is that public education is the only inheritance that many children in this country could ever hope to get. That's what you get from America. You get public education, poor, rich, and if you're poor, that's the only one you will ever receive, right? And so, I sort of thought of it as my obligation, having received my inheritance, to try my best to contribute to ensuring that the next generation receives its inheritance as well. And it is certainly, um, it is certainly an continuous position and growing, increasingly an continuous position uh, in recent years. I love that phrase, that the idea of it's our, our inheritance. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, and, and with that, um, segue to... Um, can you talk about back to the founding? This is where I just had total gaps in my understanding. Um, can you describe the major misconceptions that most of us have, and I include myself in that, obviously, about the importance of education to our founding fathers and how and why free public education became codified in state constitution across the nation? It's just fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of educators on here, and probably many of them have heard of the Northwest Ordinance, and, and there's, mm -hmm. there's, it's got a lot of confusing land pieces to it. But, but let's back up to the Constitution first. Right? One of the primary things that opponents of public education will say, particularly at the federal level, is that the word education does not uh, appear in the United States Constitution. And what I talk about early in the book is that there's a good reason why it doesn't appear there, because the commitment to public education actually precedes the United States Constitution itself. Oh, wow, well, that's interesting. Um, but let's even back up before that and say, well, why does it proceed it and what legal, why does it end up there? You know, ultimately we had a, a number of paranoid uh, white men who were a little bit concerned about handing over political power to regular people. Now by regular people, they didn't mean women and they certainly didn't mean black people, but they meant other white people with land, farmers, right? If we're gonna let farmers vote on stuff, my goodness, they need to understand the common good. My goodness, they need to be able to read uh, the newspaper. And in fact, if you think about it, right, at that point in time, there would have been absolutely no way for a farmer to have any concept whatsoever of what was happening in Raleigh other than by reading the newspaper or going to the saloon and talking to someone who had read the newspaper, right? And most farmers were busy enough that they didn't spend a lot of time at the saloon, they're on the farm, right? So ultimately the newspaper and the ability to read are sort of a key piece of this. And so Adams and Jefferson in particular um, are committed to this idea that um, turning political power over to regular people means that they will be able to cast a ballot intelligently. Adams writes extensively about the importance of public education. Of course, Jefferson does as well. But Adams writes uh, the 1785 Constitution of Massachusetts, which again precedes our own Constitution. And in it, he put for the first time in world history, at least the first time that I'm aware of, a constitutional obligation of state government to provide public education to its citizens at common expense. Adams had said it was more important for the upper ranks of society to do this than it was the lower ranks. Because again, he was saying, look, if the lower ranks aren't educated and brought into the common good, they'll just take our stuff away through the ballot. That's what the Koch brothers have been worried about. They'll just take our stuff away through the ballot, right? So we see Adams doing this. We see a lot of writings uh, of Jefferson in a similar vein. Let me sort of 
push it forward more quickly. There's a, a famous law for the diffusion of, of knowledge in Virginia that comes forward that, that Jefferson's wanted to do the same thing uh, in, in Virginia. It failed narrowly. One of the explanations, or at least as Jefferson tells, it wasn't a lack of commitment by the people of Virginia, but that Virginia basically absorbed the debt of, uh, of the revolution, or at least a large portion of it, and couldn't afford it. But what happens, though, interestingly, with the Northwest Ordinances, if you read it very closely, those Northwest Ordinances are the echoes of Jefferson's uh, Bill for the Common Diffusion of Education in Virginia and the Massachusetts Constitutional Obligation for Education. So what is Northwest Ordinance and what's that to do with the United States Constitution? In the book, I describe the Northwest Ordinance as being the land deal um, that makes the Constitution possible. So we have this 1785 uh, ordinance, and then they, re they amend it in the summer of 1787, about six weeks before uh, the United States Constitution uh, is hammered out in Philadelphia. And the reason why it's the land deal that makes the Constitution possible, and this, you know, this is one thing, and one of the very few things that, that, that Jack Boger didn't teach me, because uh, we didn't have enough time, we only had four hours of con law, but um, was that for whatever reason, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut all thought they owned the Northwest Territories. There were these competing claims. They all said, we own Ohio. Well, and we didn't have Illinois as a named place, but there's this huge chunk of land, the Northwest, you know, uh, or Northwest lands, which are just West, what we now know as Ohio and Westward. And you cannot have a United States of America if the states themselves all believe they own this, this territory, right? So what the Northwest Ordinance does is, is dictate the terms by which, well, number one, it requires all the states to give up their claims to the Northwest Territory. And number two, it dictates the terms by which those lands will become states. And in fact, some 30 odd states uh, or 20 some odd states since then have come into the union under those same terms. But the key language there is not just that land deal, but that every square inch of land the United States owned would be carved up into squares. Each town would have 32 squares in it. And the 16th square, the center square, would be reserved for schools. And nine of the outer lying uh, lots would be reserved to generate resources for those schools. So before we even have a United States Constitution, we have a path towards statehood, a path towards entering the union that has public education at its center. Thus, no need. I'm not saying they would have necessarily uh, mentioned education with that, with, without that, but no need to mention education there. And so um, this explains why, at least at that point, every single, virtually every single new state um, puts education in its constitution because it had been part of what had been required in the Northwest Ordinance itself. And last point, so I don't go on too long, the same people who voted on the Northwest Ordinance in large part are the same people who ratify the Constitution. In fact, the uh, Congress was in session uh, in New York at the time, that's where Congress was at, when they were um, de debating the Constitution in Philadelphia and they did not have a quorum to do business because there were too many delegates in Philadelphia. So the Secretary uh, of Congress sends, in, sends a letter, uh, presumably by a horse, uh, to Philadelphia saying, hey, we need some of you guys to come back for what they called the most pressing needs of the nation so we can pass this legislation. So I think they needed two or three more folks for a quorum, two or three, I think they were, it may have been the New Yorkers, they went ahead and went home at the same time. I think there may have been a North Carolinian, I don't know, but in any event, um, they, go, uh, they go to New York, within a day, they have the quorum and they unanimously, pa unanimously pass the Northwest Ordinance, they ride back to Philadelphia, they finish hammering out the Constitution. And then after the Civil War, that was part of um, the the reentry of the southern states into part of the nation that it was contingent on providing for education for all for all. Yeah, so that you know, as grand of a story as I just sold you, the truth of the matter is it didn't it didn't amount to much in Ohio, right? Initially, I mean, there was plenty of mismanagement of land. Um, there, there's plenty of sort of challenges on the frontier. 
And, you know, building a system of public education out of nothing is not an easy thing. Um, the reason why I focus on the Northwest Ordinance and then I'll jump to the reconstruction is that it does create what I call a North Star. Right. Even if you haven't gotten where you're supposed to get, this is where the country is supposed to go. And I think that's important to recognize. Um, but at that same moment or over the next you know, half century, it's also true that we have, uh, you know, two million enslaved people in the South. Right. And we have uh, tons of, uh, of white children as well who don't have access to public education. So we may have had grand ideas about public education, uh, but at least up through the Civil War, particularly in the South, there is nothing that would resemble anything that we would call public education uh, in the South. They don't have it in their constitutions. Um, plantation owners are not interested in paying taxes uh, to pay for some other children's education. And in fact, had, uh, had sort of lobbied against public education. And so we really don't have widespread education for anyone in the South. At the end of the Civil War, um, there was a lot of talk in the South, and this was probably far flung, but Charles Sumner, for instance, had said that he, that he thought if the South had been better educated, it never would have seceded to begin with. I, I'm not so sure about that, but I think his point is well taken, which is that the South's illiteracy rates were four times those. And if we were going to have a democracy, a rebirth of democracy, uh, in, in this country, that it required that everyone, uh, that all whites begin to get access to public education. But this was also going to be the means by which uh, formerly enslaved people would be elevated to citizenship. And so education is absolutely a key part of Reconstruction. There was a debate in the Senate um, in which Charles Sumner put uh, an amendment, uh, put forward an amendment to the Reconstruction Act of 18. Uh, 67, in which he was going to make it an explicit condition of reentering the union, not that you have, not just that you have public education, but that students be admitted to all, be admitted to those schools on a non-discriminatory basis. Now talk about radical, right? You know, folks nowadays think that, you know, everyone was sort of dumb back then and we're so progressive and also, then we have someone insisting on integrated schools in 1867 as a condition for readmission. Um, it fails by a vote of 2020. You need 21. Um, it fails 2020. Now, I will say a few of those who voted no on it said, we're not against public education, but we're against the idea of dictating in advance terms to the South of readmission in, the, in this way. So it's still a requirement that they submit their constitutions to us. We'll read them and then we'll determine whether they're sufficient. But the conditions of readmission were uh, ratify the 14th Amendment, which extends citizenship to African-Americans, guarantees equal protection, due process, so on and so forth, uh, to extend the right to vote to black men and to rewrite your constitution to conform to a Republican form of government. Now, they don't define Republican form of government, but for those folks who had been in legislatures and Congress they knew what a Republican form of government meant. It meant the same thing it meant in 1776 when, uh, when Adams and Jefferson were talking about the need for educated voters, right? And so um, Congress makes it clear um, in that debate, but also uh, through the Freedmen's Bureau, that education is to be part of rewriting these constitutions. And all the Southern states rewrite their constitutions and include an affirmative obligation to provide public education in it. 1868, North Carolina gets a new education article. So does South Carolina. So does Georgia. We can go on and on down the list, except for three states. There were three states that were slow uh, to get their business done. That was Virginia, Mississippi, and Texas. And because they had been slow, and because there was concerns about their commitment um, to a Republican form of government, Congress explicitly conditioned the admission of those last three states on them never depriving anyone of the education rights they had just vested in their state constitution. So as of 1868, we have an explicit, explicit condition on readmission. And after 1868, no state is ever admitted to the union without guaranteeing public education and its constitution. One state, New Mexico tried, Congress rejected its uh, petition for admission for that and other reasons 
it rewrote it, it put it in there, and we have a, a uniform process of you must provide for public education. Also, in the 10 to 20 years following um, uh, the Civil War, the northern states that didn't already have affirmative uh, obligations in there, when they went through their next round of, of revisions to their constitutions, put it in there as well. So Pennsylvania, for instance, which had, you know, compared to others, a decent public education system, but it wasn't providing for everyone in 1874, you know, they amend their constitution, they put uh, they put an affirmative obligation. I could tell you similar stories of other states, but in any event, we really go at that point, at least in the constitutional commitment, we go to a unified nation uh, guaranteeing the right to education through state constitutions in the aftermath of the Civil War. So, so in the in the book, you describe how this value, this public education, had really taken hold once people get the right and they start being educated. So, during Reconstruction, it had really taken hold among the middle class and poor whites, especially in the South. Um, and why the shift, the you know the the backlash that you talk about after some of these eras, the backlash to Reconstruction, why that. Um, that the fact that this public education had taken hold among the middle class and poor whites really helped ensure that this notion of public education endured. So I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about that and whether you believe that same kind of support exists today. Like think about what's happening now and and with public education and that notion of this support for it among all classes. Yeah, so what I describe as a silver lining in in the Jim Crow era is that yeah. um, this sort of extension of public education to black people was obviously a contested issue amongst the, some of the former Confederates, right? And so some, of, and they realized what public education meant for black people. And so when the so-called redeemers uh, took over, um, they wanted to undermine black citizenship. And in those constitutional conventions, um, uh, in Mississippi, for instance, in the Constitutional Convention of 1890, uh, when it's called to order at the very beginning, the, the chairperson says, we've come here for one reason and one reason only, and it is to disenfranchise the Negro. And by that, he meant two things, take away the ballot and take away the schoolhouse. At the Mississippi Constitutional Convention of 1890, there was a proposal, a number of sort of advocates put forward to remove public education from the constitution of the state of Mississippi, because that was, even if you took away the ballot, public education maybe still provided a lifeline to some form of citizenship for, for black folks. Now the silver lining is, is that some of those former Confederates said, ah, that's a bridge too far. I mean, we're not interested in equal education for, uh, for black children but we're not gonna take public education out of the constitution. We've got a lot of constituents here that, that like this. Um, and in fact, one little, I'll try to be quick about this little sidebar. In fact, so, well, number one, they do not remove public education from, this, from the constitution, which again, it's a silver lining because they segregate education. They do some other things that undermines equality. But the way I tell it in the book is that the virulent strain of racism is still not so strong that it can stamp out public education altogether by that point. And in fact, I think he was the attorney general, I, I forget, but um, someone had, had, after the Constitutional Convention, engaged in some, some machinations to reduce overall funding uh, uh, for schools. And the attorney general of the state of, uh, uh, Mississippi, if I'm recalling correctly, sues the states, telling them that the state saying you you violated the Constitution um, and some others were statutory frameworks because he said, look, you know, my, my folks don't want you cutting the public education budget here back at home. So in any event, right, I think it, it's it's important. The second part of your question, though, was th does any of that survive today? Well, there, there's a lot of I've got, so there's a lot that good and bad uh, that survives, I suppose, from that era. But I would say, and, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit towards the end, that I think when we think about our rural communities, I think a lot of that does survive. I mean, it may not survive in their mind in the way that I'm articulating, but those public schools are uh, the center 
of many rural communities. They are the central infrastructure and community and pride and togetherness of those rural communities. And I think, you know, when I'm giving people strategic advice, I often say like, look, you know, we often think of these, this is a Raleigh issue or this is an Albemarle issue, whatever, right? That we sort of divide this like, or sometimes we forget about our really rural communities and, and don't think about them. I think these issues of uh, underfunding and vouchers and charters may very well be an even greater threat to the future of education for our rural communities. And I think it's engaging and helping them understand that because they are not ready to give up their public schools. I mean, you look at Texas, for instance, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, the progressive, so to speak, in Austin that have been stopping vouchers from getting through that legislature. It's the small thousand person school district out in West, wherever Texas, right, that got on the bus and drove to Austin and said, this isn't right. You know, you're talking about spending half a billion dollars on vouchers. You know, we can't even do the most basic things in our small communities. And so we don't want you to do a single thing in public education until you have first provided uh, for, for our schools. And I think Texas has done a great job and maybe some of that's a product of Texas Education Association, I don't know. But I think, um, I think South Carolina has certainly struggled uh, to, to cross uh, cross that bridge. And, and, but I think in the South in particular, that, that's what I'm telling folks is that we need to build relationships with our rural communities. I was sitting and I'm getting carried away, but I was sitting in an oral argument in the, in the South Carolina Supreme Court just last week in our voucher case. Um, I'd filed a brief in that case and a, a rural Republican was sitting right behind me. And he said, I was against it the first time they, they, they said something to me and I'm against it today and I'm gonna be against it. And I, I leaned back over the bench and I said, I said, what are they doing over there in the state house? I said, Don't, isn't there a bridge that needs to be built in your district? Isn't there a few bricks that need to be laid at this? Uh, anyway, I was being rhetorical, but the point, uh, yes, yes, yes. And these fools uh, are running around shouting uh, about how much we need vouchers when we can't do the most basic things back in some of these rural communities. And I just think we need to drive that point uh, home because those are often, right? A lot of those folks run committees, uh, you know, that they're Republican chairs and they're running committees or House Ways and Means. And I think bringing them into the fold as opposed to alienating them and having their local communities and their local school board members calling them uh, and getting them engaged, I think is, is key. And I think you have that, and that way you have a pretty close resemblance of the conversation we were just having about Mississippi in 1890, right? I mean, for goodness sakes, if public education uh, can survive uh, Jim Crow, surely to God it can survive Betsy DeVos and, 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 and that other guy who was president, right? And I think our communities understand that if we, if we put it in the right, right context. I, I really hope you're right. <laughs> and I, um, so, I know you know about Leandro, and I was thinking about Leandro while you were talking, our 30-year case for adequate funding uh, in our public schools. And I just, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how that, the context of Leandro and our General Assembly refusing to fund education and not, in my view, just not abiding by what our constitutional Constitution says because we have a constitution that's very explicit, like you're talking about. Um, and I, in your book, you mentioned Kansas, where the Supreme Court basically put their foot down and said, "Look, you need to fund. It's in our constitution, et cetera, et cetera." And I imagine you're aware of our recent or oral arguments in Leandro. So, can you talk a little bit about that and what's happening in in our state in light of all the historical context that's in your book and that you're sharing with us? Um, the role yeah. of the Supreme Court. Well, I had the good fortune of being a student uh, at, at the law school when it went to remand. And I think some fancy lawyers from Hogan and Hartson showed up uh, at the courthouse and, and thought they were going to talk. And I, I, I think that Judge Manning said, you know, I've heard enough of them. Let, let, let's hear what Boger has to say. And so I got to do a few assignments uh, for him and go hear some of those hearings. So, I mean, you didn't ask for personal war stories, but I will say that um, 
and I said this to, to folks in Kentucky as well, which they had a, a major decision in 1989. But, you know, the one benefit of being, um, I guess, a, a cousin to North Carolina as opposed to a, an actual insider is to be able to look at it from a distance and see what a special place it was uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. Right? I mean, North Carolina is the envy of the entire Southeast and, and mid-Atlantic, right? I mean, you have a, a strong public education system, notwithstanding Leandro, you have a, you have a Supreme Court that seems committed to, to forcing the state uh, to do right by its, uh, by its children. Um, you know, you, before I had been there, you had a governor that had certainly made education a priority. And so there's, every reason to believe that, you know, North Carolina would be, uh, continue to be a shining beacon of the South and that its Supreme Court would, would, would maybe, you know, help it reach heights that would rival uh, any place in the nation. I was also there uh, during the Obama's first midterm when things, you know, drastically changed. But, you know, I point back to that moment because, I mean, North Carolina has been battered and besieged so much over the last 15 years that I imagine that if you're living it day to day, that sometimes it's hard to remember that great trajectory that North Carolina was on. Um, and, and I might also add to that, um, you know, I've written just a little bit about it. I think when we talk about the sort of charter expansion, which happened during Obama's midterm and then also the vouchers following that. I don't think it's any accident that North Carolina was also, well, let me start. There had never been any school system or state that's fully desegregated its system in the history of this country. But if you were gonna say what state came closest I would put to you that it's probably North Carolina. I don't even normally put that word probably in front of, it, right? That you had the most aggressive uh, forms of integration going there and, and enormous change happening. And, right, it, it lasts, right? Notwithstanding that the desegregation order is terminated in 1999 in, in Charlotte, you know, you have Raleigh pushing forward with its socioeconomic plan sort of maintains that, voluntarily maintain that into the future. So I don't think it's any accident that a state that had made those commitments to education, that at first was drug into desegregation, but then maintained some commitment to it. I don't think it's any mistake or any accident that it is also the place um, in which we saw a desire for an exit from the system. Right, that charter schools become the means by which to dissent, dissent from our constitutional values. They become the means by which to uh, exit on the public dollar. And I think if if you look at um, uh, you know some of the research uh, um, out of you know very important North Carolina scholars pointing out that you know the charter schools are becoming wider at the same time the public schools are becoming more enrolled by children of color. That is actually different than most other states in the country. In most other states, charter schools are predominantly located in you know, high poverty, high minority communities, and it's an exit for them. But in North Carolina, it's acting as an exit for white children. And then of course, in Charlotte, you know, uh, I'm getting way off, somewhat off of topic, but then, you know, then you have the legislature in, in, in North Carolina authorizing uh, a special tax power for four schools in the entire state. And where are they? They're in the white suburbs of Charlotte, right? And so um, I think, uh, you know, you asked about Leandro, I told a very long story, but it is because North Carolina had so much going for it. And that's, Part of the backlash, right? And um, I guess the real question now uh, is whether the rule of law means anything in North Carolina. That ultimately, uh, Leandro uh, has stood for close to three decades at this point. Um, there's never been a finding of compliance uh, in, or full compliance in those 30 years. Uh, the state has, over the last decade, insisted 
that uh, that it wouldn't comply. And now maybe the court is going to help it. Maybe it won't. I, I think that uh, with some of the good work of the of the litigants um, uh, and Amiki, I think that they probably shamed the court enough that it is not going to facially undo what was done before. Maybe it'll send it back to a remand, and then and then we'll we'll see. I mean, I think there are problems with that, but I mean, hopefully, hopefully the rule of law matters, right? And then you know, uh, I don't know how I can connect Mississippi. Um, well to to Leandro but I mean it is there is there is something about throwing education away that is distasteful there is something about taking a constitutional obligation or undermining a constitutional obligation for no reason other than politics that is extremely distasteful now I guess I get well I guess the judges in North Carolina are do have some partial political accountability. But I, I, I am quite sure that um, that there will be political repercussions uh, on if if truth can be shined on it. There will be political repercussions for individuals who um, who turn their back on their constitutional obligation and say the rule of law doesn't matter in the state of South Carolina. But we'll see. We'll see. I, I, I'll confess right now that I'm the type of person that insists uh, that the glass is uh half full when it's darn near bone dry so you have to you have to be careful about putting too much stock in, in my prognostications oh it does feel it does feel pretty dry right now actually but it'll be interesting to see um what ends up happening for sure so um so we uh one of the things um, I found so interesting in your book is the way you talked about these different backlashes these periods and then the backlash and you know, so can you talk a little bit about how you see this current assault and this emergence of, um, you know, privatization as similar or different um, from what was happening in the previous backlashes, like after Reconstruction that we talked about, and then the Civil Rights era, and then the Great Recession in 2018, and and even specifically in in North Carolina, is just this effort. This it seems like this is a new thing. It's, or maybe it's just getting exacerbated with the effort of all the billionaires to fundamentally change America through changing education. Um, and how do we well, resist it? Well, let me muzzle myself. As you can tell, I get to talking about things uh, before I was born and, and I go on and on. But so let, let's just talk about uh, the last decade. Now we certainly had some voucher, we had massive voucher expansion in, in, in a few states, Indiana, Florida. Um, but you know, the movement had, it really wasn't spreading, right? I mean, think about you know, Betsy DeVos. She spent four years preaching and pleading for vouchers and couldn't couldn't get Congress to do anything, couldn't get any movement hell, right? That it was really just a one-person show, uh, at least. At, at, at the sort of governmental level on vouchers uh, from 2016 to, to most of 2020. Um, and I think that, that's important to remember. So you had the Koch brothers saying, well, look, we, maybe we can do it state by state, right? So they're pushing an individual state, but they're still encountering stiff resistance, right? The Texas story I was telling you earlier is a story of 2018, right? In which, you know, uh, the movement fails. And, um, you know, they don't get off the ground in Arizona either. They declared Arizona uh, ground zero for uh, with low hanging fruit for the privatization of education. And, um, you know, there's a statewide referendum uh, to bar vouchers and it and, and that bar passes at 60 to th 60 to 40. I mean, it wasn't even close. Right. Um, and so, you know, there's lots of troubling stuff going on with charters during that period, right, during the Great Recession went from uh, having about a million students enrolled in charters to we have about 3.3 .3 million, I think now. So, so uh, vast expansion, but vouchers were still captured. We're still sort of um, a, a side issue, but during COVID, right? Um, and, you know, with, with, with President Trump, right? That it became an ideological issue, right? It, it wasn't just the thing of anti-government, right? I often say, if you're anti-government at the federal level, you're anti-Medicare, you're anti-Social Security. If you're anti-government at the state level, you're anti-public education. Well, that was not 
a program that you could sell terribly well to regular people. But during COVID with the sort of ideo ideological and rhetorical arguments that our children are being indoctrinated, that critical race theory is teaching children to hate white people and hate themselves and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, they're trying to transition your child to a, to a, a different gender or sex, right? All of this, and of course, just the sort of emotional weakness that we all as humans felt during uh, this terrible, you know, global crisis, that they began to play on fear, right? They finally found something, right, to sort of use fear against the public schools. But it was actually a different crew, right? That was that was not that wasn't the the Koch brothers' agenda, right? Um, this is more of an alt right, right, sort of agenda, and also some some. Uh, religious elements there who'd been upset about what was being taught in schools for, for decades. But what you ultimately had was this joining of the uh, anti-government group with sort of a far-right ideological group. And then, to be clear, there's never been a moment in the history of many communities in our country in which we have fully and fairly met the needs of poor students and children of color. And some of them, you know, it, it's mighty rich of me to say, hey, you know, we've got a state constitution, North Carolina will take care of you. Well, that's fine, Derek, you know, your, your kids are being taken care of. That That's not a luxury that some parents uh, have to put faith in the state of North Carolina or South Carolina. So I can't second guess communities of color who, who believe the state has let them down for, uh, you know, a couple centuries and they're not waiting anymore. So, you know, you have a few different elements that come together, that coalesce for something that we have never seen before, right? Um, and so um, it, it, it's become a litmus test, um, sort of being for vouchers seem, is seemingly a litmus test uh, for a lot of candidates now and a lot of donors. And there's a lot of donors that are pouring tremendous amounts of money to, to shape primaries and, and, shape, uh, and shape the... Um, uh, the state house, and I know it's been quite effective here in South Carolina. We're we're a little bit behind you in a good way, but it's kind of cheap to buy uh, some southern state houses, right? That they never have had this sort of cash and lobbying in this way, and particularly with a small state like South Carolina. So you can buy a state house if you're really committed to you know the destruction of public education or sort of the pushing of sort of. Uh, uh, a sort of fear to achieve political agendas. So in any event, we, we really are in a, in a frightening place um, there. Although I do think people are starting to wake up. I think you can only scare people so many times until they realize that there's, there's nothing to be scared of. So I do think that they're, it is flattening out, but, but it's still real and still there and still being pushed. So you had mentioned that you're the glass half full uh, person. And I, I I had a question here I wanted, you know, and you've addressed a lot of it about what happened since the book was published. Um, but when in your book, you were very optimistic about the resilience of the idea of public education and felt that it was going to withstand the bumps and bruises that inevitably come its way. And how are you feeling right now? I, I got the sense that you're still optimistic, but you want to talk a little bit more about how and how that can all, how you imagine it working out to our, the endurance of public education. Yeah, well, my feelings uh, aren't too much, aren't worth too much in the classroom. They shouldn't be worth too much here either. So I, I, I would say, but what we have is hard data, right? Mm -hmm. That um, at least, in, you know, about, six, seven years ago, there were, and I talk about this in the book, public polling data across the South showing that there was no more than two to five points separating Republicans from Democrats on a host of very basic education questions, right? Are the schools fairly funded? Do they have the resources they need? Does the state need to fix it? So on and so forth. I mean, I was quite shocked to see, right, that the responses to those questions, uh, most of those questions are in the 80s and sometimes up into the 90s and no more right, than two to five, six points separating Democrats from Republicans. And so that gave me a lot of confidence. But I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that we've lost five or 10 percentage points across the board with Democrats. And we've probably lost more than that percent with Republicans. 
fortunately, we were starting in the 80s, right? So we still are in a super majority position, but um, but we have slipped. So that that that's the short answer is that I, you know, I have faith because that well of support was so deep, but it's not as deep today as it was four years ago. And I think we have to acknowledge that. I hope and, and do believe it's still enough to get us through. But as I say in the book, surviving is not enough, right? Mm -hmm. That I mean, I want our public schools to survive, but they were not. I mean, one of the things that people want to heckle me about, you're saying the public schools are, are great and perfect. No, I'm not saying that. I say we just need to keep them, right? They were not perfect. They had never served all of our students fully and fairly before. And so we're really just trying to reach towards that more perfect union. But I think we've still got a big gap to close even if we survive what's going on with vouchers. And I think that I think that requires uh, some hard looks uh, in the mirror in terms of how we talk about public schools, um, how we fund them, and, and, and also how we include everyone. Now, I may upset some folks when I say this, you know, a lot of the conversation about inclusion has been about including uh, formerly disadvantaged or, 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 or excluded students. And that's, of course, what I believe we should be doing. But that conversation has moved forward in some places in a way that seems to exclude other folks. Now, I'm not saying that's true. That's a perception problem, maybe on their part. But, you know, public schools are about relationships. So in some respect, the reality doesn't matter. What matters is how do parents feel about their schools? What, even more important, what's the relationship between uh, Jane and her teacher? What's the relationship between the teacher and her principal? That's what public school is built upon, right? Relationship, I talk about some of my own personal ones in, in, in the book. And so, you know, I say at the end of the book, I think we have to open those doors up to our public schools wide to have very uncomfortable conversations, very uncomfortable conversations about race and about gender and sex. And they're not about convincing someone else that you're right. Maybe I'll end and we can go to, go to some questions from others. I remember that I love telling this story about my grandfather. Um, and I think it relates to the current moment. Um, a member of my family, will just say, had done something that I think was objectively wrong. Um, it wasn't a big deal. It was over a lawnmower, but it was objectively wrong. My grandfather was upset about it at nine o'clock. I was still upset at 11 o'clock. And at 12 o'clock, you know, I was sort of, I was ready. And I said, he needs to do this, that. And, and my grandfather said, it's over. I said, what do you mean it's over? He did, it, it, it. he said, that man is a member of our family. He is going to be a member of our family before this conversation and over it and after it. And all that matters is keeping the family together. And I think there's really something to be said about our public schools that as we are fighting to sort of get a dominant position, you know, whoever the we is, to get a dominant position in the ideology of school, we are destroying our families. And I think what we really need to come back are, yeah, we can have these tough conversations. But the object of those conversations is not that we leave as a divided school, but that we leave on some ground upon which we can agree to disagree, right? And I think that's, that's we forgot how to agree to disagree and we've just learned how to alienate folks. And so um, I, I think, uh, and what makes our schools unique and have made them unique for 200 years is that it is the only place in American society where we try to do that. And I think we need to start trying to do that harder than we've been. I, I'm gonna, thank, you for, thank you for that. Let's do exactly what you said, Derek, and let's give the mm -hmm. audience an opportunity. This has been a fascinating conversation so far. And my goodness, I could let you talk for two more hours. Uh, you are such a, um, such a knowledgeable person on these issues that all of us have these deep, in, you know, desire to learn more about. But let's, um, Susan Perry, I see that you had a question. I wonder if you'd like to unmute yourself and just um, ask your question directly to Derek. Sure. Hi, Derek. Thank you. This has been so interesting. And after I asked my question the first time, you did um, cover some of this in, in your discussion of what people who were strongly supportive of vouchers and charters were thinking today, but I still always have 
a very hard time trying to imagine what people who are willing to, to sort of slowly, um, carelessly dismantle the public school system that serves the vast majority of our children, what they envision they'll be left with when they've done that. How, even if you didn't care a great deal about educating all children well, how would such a, a kind of um, haphazard system, air quotes, even even work to, to do a, a minimum job? And, uh, and people in people in business must care about this, I would think. Yeah, well, actually, you you hit on something that I I think uh, is important. You know, I talked about rural communities. I think getting business involved is is important uh, because they rely upon data, they rely upon uh, prepared workers, and um, it, it, it's far from clear that current public education policy is going to serve their business interests. Um, but um, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, legislatures tend to be short-sighted in, in, in many respects. So I guess we could say that first. Um, they also think of public education as a behemoth, right? They can shed weight without, uh, you know, without uh, going under. But I mean, I, I, I think we could probably all recognize that, you know, there are tipping points, right? And I'll tell you one tipping point so as to not go on too long. If our public schools become the place where only poor children go, the public education project is over. I know I said I'm optimistic, but I'll say that again. If our public schools become the place where only poor children go, the public education project is over. And the reason for that is one, it will have a segregated system, but more so um, public education, if it is a commitment to the common good, um, how are you going to get the most politically in influential and highest taxpayers to be invested in a system that they've that they've exited. And I think that's the, the real danger spot in my mind. I mean, maybe an integrated, smaller public education system could thrive. A fully funded, you know, integrated public education system could thrive alongside more vouchers. But no such thing will exist because what the vouchers are asking us all to do is retreat to our own silos our own stories and our own versions of reality. Um, and again, if, if the only people left in public schools are, are, are poor children, it's over. And I don't, I think there's a lot of naivete about that. I just think there's there's a lot of, uh, a lot of legislators that just can't see that far into the future because they're reacting to political donations in the immediate, in the immediate moment. And, and, you know, whoever the party chair is, it's insistent they vote one way or the other. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, but that that's how that that's how I see the current moment. Yeah, thank you. And, and Derek, um, you know, there's a, a several comments in the chat, and I'll just kind of summarize one of the one theme, which is around that the um, that of you know caring about public just undermining public education because it's another way to get at the other thing you mentioned, right? The right to the ballot and the right to public education. And that there is, is there some relationship between this ideology that's being pushed by the re primarily Republican party in our state, which is that, you know, uh, we're, we're, we're getting people out of public, public government schools and into the private sector. And then, you know, what's gonna happen with, like you said, their interests in, and their ability to, to be that uh, engaged, informed electorate. Well, I will say to that, you know, and I talk about this a little bit in the book, and maybe I talk about North Carolina more than I should in the book, but, you know, I do point out, I'm not saying it's causation, but it's at least a correlation, things happening at the same time, that um, the war on public education occurs in the state of North Carolina um, at the same moment, of course, when they're designed to, to gerrymander, you know, voting districts, but maybe also important um, is that also at the moment in which North Carolina's public schools became majority low-income students, right? That actually, if you go back and look at, I think it was a Southern Education Foundation 
uh, report showed that North Carolina tipped in that same period, right? I mean, is that accidental? Is it accidental that the percentage of, of low-income students in the state of North Carolina is going up and, and finally reaching and then passing 50% at the moment that North Carolina decides that it doesn't want to pay for public education? I mean, even if you take race out of it, uh, not that we can ever do that. I mean, that has always been the challenge of, of a common good public education system is having people uh, contribute to a system to fund other people's children. And when you envision those children as being like your children, that's an easier thing to do. But when you begin to envision them as being unlike your own children, that becomes uh, a, a higher political hurdle to cross. And that, that unfortunately is a hurdle that is only going to get worse and only going to get higher. Um, I know you, you have some data you may want to share uh, with the voucher system that is pulling uh, more and more high income children out of the public school system, or right. at least intends to or will pull more and more uh, right. higher income children out of the system. Right, we're starting to trend that way. And Julie, I see your question, but I'm going to get Laura Stillman first, and then I'm going to come back to Representative Julie Von Hafen. So Laura Stillman, did you want to make a comment? If you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Laura? Okay, so I may... Okay, here we, go. here we go. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Listen, thank you very much. This has been fascinating. And I think what is so incredibly bizarre as you were talking about how it's the rural areas and the rural public schools that are gonna be most affected by what's happening with the vouchers. And it occurs to me, not that it's a big moment, but I would again, assume that many, many, many of the voters for this Republican party or this MAGA party in North Carolina are rural people. That's the whole problem right now is that Democrats tend to be able to win the metro areas, but there are so many rural counties in North Carolina and we just have not done as good a job trying to get voters back into our camp. So again, those are gonna be the people that will be hurt the most. Are they not, are they just all in because the Republican Party has told them this will be a good thing, you ought to do this? Or do they just simply not realize they are really hurting their own self-interest by following this sort of plan? And it is going to result in, as you said, that there will only be poor children left in the public schools, particularly in the rural counties. And they're not the counties that are growing, by the way, as we know. So I'm not sure what what would you say about that? And is that, do you see that happening in other states as well? That the rural counties are getting hurt by this shift in public education, and yet they're also supporting the governments that are causing that. Okay. Yeah, well, I think, I, I don't think that, that, that people are, are stupid. I just think they are ignorant of certain things. And, and I think what you have is understandably, you know, these are complex education policy questions. So, you know, you're from rural county X. We don't have a charter here. We don't have any private schools. Vouchers aren't our issue, right? I mean, that's a, that's a rational response. It's like, well, that's a, that's a Raleigh issue or that's a Charlotte issue. And, you know, whatever, they'll, they'll figure that out. And so they're not really holding their own uh, representatives accountable for the downstream effects of this, right? Which is why I really think it's on us as education advocates to communicate with those communities. And, 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 and I try to do it as simply as I can. I just say, you know, when's the last time you had a new brick laid in your county? When's the last time you bought a new bus? When's the last time you had a fully staffed or fully credentialed teaching force? And if the answer to any of those is not recently, then you should be offended you should be outraged that your local representative is spending all of his education efforts to push through a voucher or a charter bill. That's not gonna do one single thing for the children in your community. And to the extent that you think somehow or another, well, at least it won't do any harm, you might say, well, when's the last time the state fully funded the formula in your state? 
in your community? Because you know what? Actually, Raleigh, whether it likes or Raleigh can make up the difference. Mm -hmm. Raleigh's got the money that if, by Raleigh, I mean Wake County. Wake County's got the money to fund its schools. If, you know, if the capital goes under, Wake County will be okay. Right. You don't, right? And so your schools are slipping and slipping each year because where are the new increases going? Where are the new expenditures going? They're all going to these side projects for, you know, vouchers or charters, you know, and I think something like of all the new education dollars spent in Arizona, something like, I don't know, maybe I'm getting this, 58% seems to come to my mind, uh, for a very small sliver of the, of the children in the state of Arizona, right? And so again, this is, this is a complicated policy issue, and I can understand why some folks in rural communities don't fully understand it. That's why I start with bricks and buses and schools. But I mean, that's ultimately, I think, the conversation that needs to be had and, you know, I think the, 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 the faith community is part of this conversation. I, I can't believe how many times I credit Texas in this conversation, but, you know, uh, you know, pastors for public schools in Texas has been doing a good job of, of, of sharing this message with their small and rural communities. I mean, there's other issues that we, you know, I disagree on, but on this particular issue, I think they've been very effective. And, you know, I've tried to, raise this issue you know do we have a pastor that can start you know a similar movement because they really are important leaders in, in in these small rural communities and i think they are ones that can deliver this message so i guess that'd be another starting point i would suggest to you in north carolina right um julie um would you unmute yourself and ask your question and Julie can um, julie von hafen is one of our representatives in in north carolina general assembly Hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I mean, I just asked, you know, basically, like, I was interested in your book, because the title was talking about the connection between education and democracy. And obviously, you've already kind of touched on gerrymandering. And like, you know, all this started, you know, when the Republicans took over the North Carolina General Assembly back in 2011, and basically have just been chipping away at public education for the last decade. And like you said, I think that the pandemic really mobilized, you know, and really pushed this forward, especially in our state. And um, so as a as an elected representative who's working on these issues, and I know we're not here to talk about political strategies or anything like that. So I don't really want to go down that <laughs> that rabbit hole, but thank you. I would love to kind of like hear from you about you know how we can talk about public education and the and the connection to democracy and why education is so important for democracy and why we see you know these attacks on democracy, whether it's gerrymandering, voting rights, you know all these things, and how that is connected to to public education. Yeah, well, I, I've got a, another book that I, you won't have to suffer through until some future point. But, you know, we don't have a lot of we have a lot of rhetoric in, in America about how important uh, uh, public education is to a democratic project. And we've certainly got a lot of beliefs about that. And that's largely what my book is, is sort of tracing that idea and that commitment across time. But as to this question of how it really matters or doesn't matter, I've been spending a lot of time looking overseas, right, at developing democracies or um, democracies that, that are failing, right? And I think when you look in the international context that you really do see that education has been a central part of trying to transition countries to democracy, but it has also been an institution that autocrats capture, right? Um, that they, you know, for all the accusations uh, of indoctrination in our public schools, right? Um, you haven't seen anything, and I'm not gonna name countries, I don't like to point fingers too much, but you haven't seen anything until you look at, at some of our international competitors in terms of what they are doing to, uh, uh, to control the education system or to indoctrinate people in their political way of life. And that's what scares me in this current book and this other work I'm doing is, I mean, we're talking a lot about you know, vouchers and charters and this thing, but I get this sense over the last three years is that there's this autocratic turn in the way we run our schools. And that is extremely dangerous, not in terms of are we going to continue to build education, but is it actually a warning sign 
a flashing red warning sign of America's turn towards illiberalism, right? And I think, so I think there, you know, I, I'm not a fear monger. That's not the business that I get into. But I do think if you look at what has happened in other countries and you look at what has happened in education, we talk a lot about, you know, tax on the judiciary and what's going on in voting. And we think, oh, education, that's just something else. That's just little kids. No, that's actually part of the autocratic turn as well. And so, you know, I think people should be really disturbed. And so what I try to do both in, you know, my last book and this one is try to give people that broader lens through which to see the moment. You know, you're the professional, uh, professional uh, uh, general, general assembly member. So I'll leave it to you as to how you sort of, uh, you know, convince people that that matters. But, uh, but I do think, uh, I think there's a lot to be worried about in terms of, of taking, not only undermining public education as an institution, but removing it from the democratic project and making it a political tool. Because that's what we really see right, happening in, in the last few years is that education, I've talked about it when it becomes only pork. Well, you know what? It has become a buy. It, it, it has for 200 years been a buy, notwithstanding racism, sexism, it still has been a bipartisan project. And what we see now is a, is a moment in time when it is losing its appeal as a bipartisan project and as becoming a tool uh, of political ends. And that's very, very dangerous. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. But can you give me like one example of a country that, you, I know you don't want to call it a country, but is, is there one that, comes well, uh, that I can dig into and read a little bit more about? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not a China basher, but they spend a, a, a huge amount of time on you need to learn and believe the party line. Right. And this is what it means to, to be a Chinese citizen. We do that in democracy, too. But you get to disagree with the story you're told up front. Right. You're not a force to accept the party line. So you're allowed to promote your version of America, but you're not allowed to coerce it. Right. You see coercion there. But, you know, look at Turkey. Turkey went through uh, when Erdogan came to power uh, and, and made some some really big changes to its education system. We, 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 we could talk offline, but it, you know, Education is a tool for selling the state's uh, narrative of itself in all countries, okay? That's a given. But again, the difference is, is it an open discussion and ability to disagree with that? Or are you forced to accept one version of history or one version of whatever it is the government is telling? And, and that's what I worry is that as we see politicians playing a bigger role and what children are taught or not taught that it, it is becoming um uh it is becoming coercive as opposed to an open dialogue um it is getting um close to that time i want to make you maybe just allow one more question and then i'm going to try to do a little bit of wrap up and give professor black a chance to maybe uh kind of give us a summary statement here of what he's um, like to leave the audience with in terms of what he uh, thinks we could be doing uh, more than what he said to protect and support our schools. But I, I do want to see if there's a, a one lingering question or comment. You don't have to have a question. If you have a comment you want to make, uh, please feel free. I'm so proud to see Eva Clayton here tonight. She's one of our uh, outstanding former uh, Congresswoman and from uh, Eastern North Carolina, and so uh, so happy to see you here, uh, Eva. Um, I'm happy to see Terry Van Dyne from Asheville here, a former senator and in the North Carolina Senate. Um, I just want to say hello and thank y'all for being here. And I just wonder if there's any last comment or statement somebody would like to make before we wrap up. Okay. So um, I'm going to, um, uh, uh, Professor Blake, maybe I will restate that and let it kind of be maybe your uh, final thoughts or three or four messages that you would like to give our audience about what we can do, what we can do at this point. You know North Carolina about as well as you do South Carolina from your history and involvement. Uh, got any words of wisdom for us um, to help us figure out what we need to do over this next uh, six years? Well, I mean, look, it, it, it's all it's all local, um, but I, I'll just reiterate. I think that the the rural connection, I think, is key. You know, we, we've seen that 
uh, and, and other states. And I think we need to, we need to, to, to build those, those bridges here. Um, I, I would also just sort of point out, you know, House Ways and Means, or maybe more Senate Ways and Means, you know, that, that really is an enormous uh, contact point because I think this is the other thing you see in other states is like you have all sorts of crazy ideas happening in the education committee and maybe even on the floor, but, you know, House and Senate ways and means they're about business. And I've seen I've seen many a bad education bill with a big dollar tag on it die in the ways and means committee, not because they objected to the idea, but they just objected to the cost. And I know you've got some some escalating costs there in, in North Carolina, potentially, um, you know, I think Arizona legislators are choking right now because they were told that the voucher bill would cost them uh, somewhere between 30 and 45 million dollars and they're steering a 437 million dollar uh, uh, budget uh, in the face next year, right? You know, you know, the ideologues, they love it. You know, Ways and Means does not like that, right? And so make friends with Ways and Means, right? Um, and there's still conservative, fiscal conservatives out there, right? And th th those are your friends. Uh, one other thing I'll, I'll say, and this was on charters, I did a piece um, for, um, uh, uh, for Tennessee um, on stranded costs. And some of that actually was built on Helen Ladd's work there in North Carolina. But look, you know, local county commissioners and, you know, local school boards, they, they don't want to have to pick up bigger and bigger chunks of the pie, right? And so I think going to them, or they're normally worried about roads, right? Well, they ought to be worried about stranded costs uh, for operating their school systems. And I think that stranded cost analysis, which Helen Ladd um, has dealt with and some others have dealt with in, in, in other, I think, very helpful ways in other states, all that same analysis applies to the voucher issue as well. Right? I mean, you know, there are going to be stranded costs. Now, I know that the appropriation for uh, vouchers in, in, in North Carolina is not coming uh, straight out of the school budget, but so long as they continue to fund schools on a on a uh, on a headcount, you're still losing the 6,500 or whatever it is that's supposed to come from Raleigh. So you're losing that 6,500 dollars, but you still have the same number of teachers. Your bus routes are still as long, and 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 unless Dominion lowers electricity, that that's not going down either, right? And so all of these costs are are sunk. And so I think you know. Finding those areas where where you can can agree with people that you might otherwise disagree, I think, are, are key to slowing it down and trying to get some reform. I could go on and on, but um, but I'll, I'll probably just stop with those. Say you need to stop with having two or three points. Don't don't go for four or five. So, okay, I'm gonna I want to bring up that slide here. I want, as a way of closing, I want to show you a quote that uh, is certainly I think Heather's favorite quote in the book. Um, and where's it at? Let's see. She's going to pull it up here. And I, I, I just invite us all to just uh, read this quickly ourselves. Because I think this is what we all believe and why we're also desperately involved in this fight to protect and to strengthen and to ask our legislators and our voters and our community people, our elected officials, to really make sure that Public Schools First is strong and is supported and, and challenged. I, I agree so much with Derek. We, we are not challenging that we don't have things that we need to fix and, and, and so forth. But you know, I think that we um, are at a crossroads that we have crossed over. We're on the other side right now of what we've been predicting might happen over the last five years. And this concept that you brought up, Julie, which I strongly believe in, is that it is the most important function of state and local government. It does serve as a foundation for good citizenship and democratic society. And if we sacrifice it, we sacrifice ourselves and our democracy. And so that is another quote from um, Derek's book, uh, which I'll leave you. And I, I, I want to encourage, thank y'all all for coming tonight. I want to thank Professor Black for uh, his book it's been an inspiration to me and, and Heather, and I hope that if all of you have not read it yet, I know, Julie, you're working on it. Um, I do encourage you to, to do so. I think it will give you a lot of perspective, as Heather said at the beginning of the workshop. And I think it will give you some talking points. and It'll give you some 
I, I hope it will inspire you, motivate you as much as it has us. And, you know, I've got, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got like 5,000 stickies from tonight, um, Derek, every time you say something, I'm like, yes, I'm going to say that. Um, so I hope that we've all learned something from that. I, I do want to point out in closing two things. One, our report that he Heather worked on extremely hard this past fall, and we updated this January. And if you want some more uh, <coughs> talking points about using your tax dollars, then this is a great report. I hope you'll look at it. It's on our website. Just go on there, look at that little magnifying glass and type in tax dollars, discriminate, and this report will pop up. But we've gone through and looked at all the private schools and their policies for who they admit, who they won't admit, uh, you know, and it's it's not a place that's open to all. They have no constitutional obligation to teach anyone uh, as long as they can prove they're not discriminating on emissions based on the, you know, the uh, gender, race and those uh, kind of things, you know, the, the civil rights uh, statement, they can do whatever they want. They can have interviews, they can uh, charge different things. So it's a very enlightening report. And then um, I want to show you, uh, Derek mentioned that I, we shared this with him a little earlier. This is just the first blush at what's happened with the first round of universal vouchers. So if you haven't um, been too concerned, I think that this is kind of living up to our expectations. Uh, they now make people apply by their tier, their level of income. If you will look at the bottom two tiers, 55% uh, of the folks who applied to get their, their coupon, their free t-shirt, their voucher, um, have been people who are well above uh, any um, uh, poverty level. They're not the original folks that our legislators said that they were setting this program up to save poor kids who would have an option to get out of the public school system. This is not happening here. 55% of the applicants so far um, were not even eligible to apply last year for a voucher because of the income was too high. So now, you know, the income level is off. They, anyone can apply of any income level and get some portion of the voucher. And so I, uh, again, uh, encourage everyone, um, and we can end the uh, uh, PowerPoint if you want, Heather, but um, I, I'm just going to say to everyone, this, our legislative short session starts April the 24th. There is no reason that you have to wait to April 24th to start talking about what we've talked about tonight. I hope that you will do exactly what Derek is encouraging us to do, which is we've got to talk to our neighbors, our friends. We have to talk about common ground and common good. We have to talk to our friends and neighbors and relatives in, in, in rural counties, not just in Raleigh and Charlotte. Um, we have to talk about the realities of what is at stake. And we have lots and lots of information. We are getting ready to launch a kind of a public Google Drive where we're going to share all the data we have, because that's always important to have your facts when you're going out and talking to folks. Um, and we are also going to invite you to join us in this conversation with our elected leaders. We are also, uh, Derek, it's so encouraging to hear you talk about talking to people at different elected levels, because that actually is one of our strategies. We are going to be talking to school board members and county commissioner members across the state. And because they are the, uh, the folks that have the most to lose right now in terms of, of being elected leaders, because they're there and they are responsible for what doesn't get done, right, uh, if, if, in, in their school system. Um, so we are going to be talking to those kind of folks. Um, so I encourage everyone to um, get involved, follow us. You know, the thing I have to say this or my staff would be upset you know, go go join us on TikTok and on Instagram and on Facebook and join, get our newsletter and go to our website. We have a lot of hardworking, smart, dedicated, passionate people who, um, and, and we've created a lot of information for you, a lot of fact sheets. But what we really need is your voice talking to those elected people who can make a difference. We need you to be an educated public education voter this fall, we have a lot to, to do. This is not uh, a political statement. This is asking you to participate in your citizen rights to vote and to go there educated on who you're voting for. Um, Derek, I just am so sorry to say goodnight because I just really want 
asked you five more questions myself, and I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I do thank you sincerely. Um, and I hope very, very much that I uh, can't wait to get your next book. And um, and I hope that um, uh, to see you uh, soon. And I hope that you'll stay involved in North Carolina. And Jack, you've got to get him up here sometime um, so that we can enjoy meeting him in person. He was fabulous, as, as he always says. He's really one of the finest uh, speakers about education, most knowledgeable and, and, and yet clear that, that, that I've ever seen. So, uh, yes, we need you to come back to North Carolina on a regular basis. The, the light will stay on for you. Okay. And, okay. So, so Derek, I have an extra bedroom. So, you know, so <laughs> I, I, Jack's in Chapel Hill, but I'm close in Raleigh. And, and I know Terry Van Dyne ha has always told me to come up here and you, I've got an extra room in Asheville. So we, we can find you a place to stay if you want to come hang out. So I go to Brevard on the weekends, but I don't. I don't think the politics get into Brevard, though. <laughs> well, now Brevard's only what thirty-five minutes, uh, Terry, away from your place. I don't know if she's left. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, but Derek, thank you uh, very thank much. You. Good night, and I hope to talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.